Cousin Fowler Road BD District zoning amendments and public comment for our items that are not on the agenda. Um, approval of the minutes from July 18. Motion to approve the minutes. Carol, one, one comment, uh, page two, second paragraph. It's the first and only time it speaks in the first person saying regarding light fixtures, what I recall is. I think it should read what he recalls is. Yes. Okay. Would you like to second the motion? I will second the motion. Any other comment? You're okay with that? No, I'm okay with that amendment. It's fine. So, all those in favor? Unanimous. All right, next item on the agenda, 517 Ocean House Road, LLC, and the Town of Cape Elizabeth remand. Um, the planning board will discuss the remand by the court in the above cited litigation. Oops, okay. So the Superior Court has remanded back to the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board the appeal of 517 Ocean House Road LLC versus the Town of Cape Elizabeth for more findings. The Planning Board discussed additional findings in response to the remand items at the July 18th meeting. The board tabled the matter so that some of the discussion that occurred on July 18th could be reduced to writing to aid the board in formulating a motion. Um, the three items remanded, the planning board discussed each item at the July 18 meeting and referenced information at, in the applicant submission, the regular planning board meeting, and the site log. So that's the work we've gone through so far, and I'm going to ask uh, our attorney, John Wall, to please come and give us a summary of the work that's been done on the suggestions. Yes, good evening, everyone. Um, so uh, this is just sort of a completion, obviously, of the process. We started the last meeting. Um, uh, in my view, since you allowed public comment at the last meeting, there's no need to go over that at ground again. All you really need to do is to formulate whatever motions you think are appropriate for additional findings or imposition of additional conditions as permitted by the court on remand. Um, it's my understanding that um, both the town planner and I uh, reviewed the uh, tape of the last meeting and attempted to encapsulate certain comments made by the board um, in proposed findings. Uh, obviously, the board is free to accept or reject the formulation that's in here. It's, primarily to focus discussion. And the same thing is true with regard to proposed conditions, a few suggestions that address um, the specific items that the, the court has uh, identified in its remand order. The only thing I would say in addition is that I think in particular with regard to the, the remand on the issue of additional findings for obscuring the view from the sidewalk to the um, parking lot, in reviewing the court's order, I do think the court uh, was looking to see in the materials something that might support it. I don't think the court was finding anything that it could readily identify in the materials. That may be, in my opinion, the one where the, the board may want to rely upon a condition as opposed to um, uh, additional findings unless the, the board feels as though the additional findings that they can articulate uh, actually are something that the the court can grab hold of and address in considering any subsequent appeal of this matter. I'm not sure what you just said. Yes, <laughs> what, I'm, what I'm saying is that with regard specifically to the obscuring issue, I think the court was looking through the materials that were part of the record that was before it to see if it could find something that was readily apparent to support the, the, the board's finding, specifically regarding between the sidewalk and the, and the parking areas. And I think the court was, didn't find anything in its review of the materials that were submitted. So in my view, I think it would probably be um, perhaps easier to deal with the court's concern by simply adopting a condition, an additional condition with regard to that issue that specifically says, in addition to the information that was provided, we think in order to ensure that the area has been obscured appropriately that it, additional conditions in terms of plantings would be recommended. So you mean a condition of approval added yes. to the yes. plan? 
which is what which is what in reviewing the court's order the court expressly granted the, the planning board on remand the right to add conditions in order to ensure that these requirements are met <coughs> i have one question sure i mean during a site walk that's considered to be evidence how do you present the evidence to the court when there's no i mean we saw we looked we judged um but there's no specific film of it or you know recording yeah and it doesn't need to be uh, what the court is looking for is an articulation as to what what the board saw okay. so for example if the board one board member proposed a finding which says it was observed during the site walk that x was the condition out there and the board agrees with that finding then that is sufficient evidence for the purposes of the court's review it just needs to know what that is and that's what okay. the court's looking for right. thank you thank you yeah. so um I am not going to open this to public comment. I think the discussion is amongst the board members, and um, our choices are we can beef up the findings, so to speak, or we can put conditions on all three of these remanded items, whichever way we want to go. So go ahead, John. I think you probably could open it up to public comment just to see. But... I, we've had it. Okay. We've had it. We've I mean, had public comment on this since 2014. That's fine. Oh. Um, yeah, my only thought is on this with the, and I'm fine with doing the condition of approval. I don't think it's necessary for the first two items. I think we've articulated that quite a bit. Um, the sidewalk issue that the court remanded, I, I, from what I looked at when we saw this, the sort of the sidewalk and the street were kind of equated into two. Um, from my perspective, but if the court's asking that we articulate the difference between the street and the sidewalk, I think then um, this condition of approval that's been um, set forth by uh, Mr. Wall and uh, Maureen, I think would uh, be adequate, and I would have no problem with adding that. I don't think we need to do it for the first two items personally, but that's just my thoughts. Any other comments? I do have one. Excuse me, Peter. Yeah. <clears throat> I, uh, in going through Maureen's memo and the potential conditions of approval that had been drawn up, I sort of like personally the idea of putting each one and all three issues. I, I don't think we lose anything by having it there. I think it reinforces the, the things we've been saying all along. So uh, if, if John feels this doesn't um, change our position vis-a-vis -vis the court i would be i would be in favor of simply adopting each one of the conditions of approval pretty much uh slotted into the draft resolution as it now reads henry yes it's just one comment on item two would you like to pull your microphone down please i will that was my job too i'm sorry about that um it said none of the existing lights are high intensity i'd like and or focused beam because a focused beam can travel further so just to point the fact that none of the beams were focused okay. Jim? on the uh, condition of approval for the plantings are we too detailed i know you took it says you took it from the town center i i, I guess inexperience on my part are we just getting too deep into it for this but i don't know Go ahead. I, the board needs to be very careful that you are not improperly delegating your authority to staff. Um, so a condition that says that you add sufficient plantings to buffer the view of the cars from the street is too broad. Uh, and that's why the condition that's been written, one, is based on an approval that the planning board granted in the past in a different district. Um, has been scaled, so it's very close to what you've done before, and I believe that it would um, it would pass scrutiny as something that wasn't delegated to staff, but was really decided by the planning board, and and then it just needs to be administered by staff. Well, I was just I quickly read this letter before the you know from what's your name um, McGeehy about. Now we're being the designer, which I don't know. I think does a bunch of crap. Is that a legal term? Um, or smoke screen? I don't know. We like I, that's what made me think of it. Well, I'll I'll say that due to the fact I learned about this letter when I got here at <coughs> six thirty, uh, I have not scrutinized the letter. Yeah. 
that had come in on a timely manner, I might have had time to really delve into it. Yeah. But based on that and based on prior comment, um, I think we know we know where they stand yeah. on this. Okay. So. All right. And we'll do what we will do and let the chips fall where they may. Would anyone over here like to comment? Go ahead, um, Victoria. Go ahead. I was just wondering, um, did the applicant have a chance to look at the landscaping? Did we receive any comments? I made sure that the entire memo that the planning board received was scanned in, was posted on the website, and a copy was sent to the applicant, the Ms. McGee. Okay. Oh, but the applicant. I, I, the, I, I sent Mr. the Taylor. copy to Ms. McGee. The entire memo was posted online. Okay, so we've received no comments back from, I was thinking Mr. Chamber the original applicant, but that's fine. Yep, it's public information, it's been posted, and, and okay. That's I'm, I'm looking at Mr. Wall. I believe we've had a conversation in the past where Mr. Wall reached out to um, the applicant's attorney. Okay. I, I, I have not spoken to the applicant's attorney specifically about this memo or any of the proposed conditions in this, but I, I don't think it's anything that the board couldn't do in granting this originally, having something specific like this with regard to the buffering, I mean the obscuring issue, if it deemed it was appropriate. So I don't, I don't think that it's necessarily something that the applicant um, would really have the ability to simply say, I'm not going to agree to that. Now, if they wanted to come back and say, well, we propose something, but it's a little different, they can certainly come in to move to amend the condition if they wanted to. Thank you. Just for Joe's, yeah, Joe's so turn. Can I just ask, so this is clarification on that point. I think we're just mixing up, or we're kind of putting applicant and appellant, um, <coughs> sort of mixing those two, so I just want to make sure we're, we're clear on who we were just discussing, and I think uh, Mr. Wall was discussing the Tamaro as the applicant, as opposed to Ms. McGay, who's who's the counsel for the appellant. Mm -hmm. Correct. All right, thanks. Good. Sorry, Good. Joe. Um, I, it seems to me to make the most sense to do the first two items as findings, and then the third item as a conditional a condition of approval. I guess my question is, if the uh, applicant wants to substitute one of the plants or alter the spacing, say, or alter the exact configuration that we've shown, would that be a de minimis change or do it, they have to come back? It depends on what they want to do. In the past, we have allowed applicants to switch in comparable materials. We have allowed slight adjustment in the placement. Um, but it would be so slight that if you're looking at what I gave you from the street, you probably wouldn't notice it. So, but again, if, if the applicant wanted to, if this whole thing ends up resolved in the courts and the applicant then wanted to come back and make adjustments, they are free to make amendments just like anyone. Okay. All right, any other discussion? Go ahead, Victoria. Uh, yes, um, in this letter that we received um, at the last minute, um, I noticed that there's a reference to floodlights uh, and that we don't know that they were angled downward. We took a sight walk. We looked at every light. We asked them to point out lights. We saw the lights. So um, this assumption that we do not know that they're angled downward is incorrect based on the sight walk. We saw them. Which we have stated more than once <coughs> in the past. Go ahead. I, I just want to make sure the, the board realizes that in the application that you received, um, there were actual pictures of the building and the pictures were submitted to show you the exterior materials, but those pictures also showed some of the lights and they all were angled downward so that we don't have a picture of every single light on the site, but there is a picture that, that supports the comments of, from your observations of the site walk. Anything else? No, I have a Go motion. Ahead. Go for it. All right. Motion to make additional findings. Be it ordered that based on the plans material and materials submitted by the applicant, advice provided by staff, including the town planner, town engineer, and code enforcement officer, 
and the site visit conducted on April 18, 2015, the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board makes the following findings in response to an order from the Superior Court and remand dated April 27, 2017 and 517 Ocean House Road, LLC versus Town of Cape Elizabeth and to supplement the findings articulated in the board at its meeting on July 19, 2016. The park, number one, the parking area behind building number three will not be used during nighttime hours and therefore lighting adequate to promote safety in the nighttime is not required. As shown on the plans, the back parking lot is proposed to be gated to prohibit use by the public and will be used only by the landscaping business, which according to the applicant has normal business hours of dusk to, uh, dawn till dusk. Number two, the light fixtures on the buildings located at 541 Ocean House Road are shielded or angled downward so that they do not unnecessarily light the night sky. During the site walk, planning board members observed that existing lighting was pointing down and the plans show that no new lighting is proposed. The materials submitted by the applicant including fo include photos of the existing buildings which, with existing lighting pointing down. None of the existing lights are high intensity and therefore would not unnecessarily light the night sky. Uh, number three, the plantings between the sidewalk and the parking area will obscure the view of parked cars and parking areas from the sidewalk. The planning board applies the required requirement to obscure to mean make in indistinct. The planning board noted that the expanse of parking and paved areas that need to be obscured is reduced by the amount of paving the applicant is removing and, placing with and replacing with grass in front of building number four. The view of the parking areas and it will be obscured with half barrels planted with or ornamental grass, granite boulders, and a landscape, uh, landscape bed around the signage. All of these measures are sufficient in the judgment of the board to soften the view of the parking area from the sidewalk in order to meet the obscuring criterion. Um, I would add a condition of approval with number three. Uh, that additional buffering be added to the plan to further obscure the parking areas from the sidewalk as follows. One, a double staggered row of 24 dwarf bottle bush, uh, <laughs> probably not going to pronounce this correctly, but fourth, fourth, fourth or giller and gardenia, two by two and a half at the time of plantings to be planted adjacent and along the east side of the 11th space parking lot. Two, a double staggered row of 16 dwarf bottle bush. Uh, for Gila Gardena, two by two and a half feet at time of planting to be planted adjacent and along the east side of the six space parking lot. Three, a double staggered row of eight dwarf bottle bush for Gila Gardena, two to two and a half feet at time of plantings uh, to be planted adjacent and along the south side of the six parking, uh, excuse me, six space parking lot. And four, a double staggered row of eight dwarf bottle bush for Gila Gardena two to two and a half feet at time of plantings to be planted adjacent and along the stripped area uh, adjacent to the four space parking lot for a total of 56 dwarf bottle bush. Um, if anybody wants to make any amendments with regards to conditions of approval, listen to those. Well, we need a second first. Okay, thanks. Second. Okay. All right. Oh. All right. Go ahead. Uh, Henry, go ahead. Yeah, on um, item two, where it says intensively like to add and or focused beams. And on number three. Just let us get let us get oh, to sorry, number, the first one. Number two, last last sentence. With existing lighting pointing down, none of the existing lights are high intensity and or focused beam. In on item three, again at the end. All of these measures are sufficient in the judgment of the board to soften. I'd like to add and make indistinct the view of the parking area. That's it for me. Do you accept those changes? Uh, well, the only the only thing I would say, Henry, is what, on number two. What are you looking for? Your add and or focused theme. Because one of the problems, of, or not the problem, but just to point out that it's not necessarily the not necessarily the um, amount of light, but the focus of the light. So that covers all of those areas that might be objectionable to lighting. Okay, I, mean, I, I have no problem with that. All oh, right, no problem with number two. <coughs> number three, I think, given that we say that. Uh, in sentence number two, the planning board applies a requirement to obscure to mean make indistinct. 
I think we'd be uh, repeating ourselves um, to add the indistinct portion um, at the beginning of the, or in the middle of that sentence because it says at the end that uh, to soften the view of the parking area from the sidewalk in order to meet the quote obscuring criteria. So I think it would be repetitive to. Yeah, well, I was just saying that indistinct is the definition of um, it, the de definition shown in the dictionary of uh, obscure. So. Right, but that the, in sentence number two it says the planning board applies the requirement to obscure to mean make indistinct. Or indistinct. Okay, I, I'll accept. Yeah. Okay. Cool. okay. Joe, do you accept the yes. change to number two? I do. Okay. Peter? <coughs> um, I, I may be the only one on the board who feels this way, but I think the conditions of approval in one and two uh, may sound a little bit like we really mean it language, but I, I don't see how it hurts us in any way, and I think it reinforces the points that those conditions make relating back to the uh, appellant's uh, Concerns, so I, I would suggest that we insert um, the conditions of approval on paragraphs one and two as well. Other, so you want be, to make that friendly uh, amendment? I would propose that as a friendly amendment, but I'm, uh, is there any discussion as to whether that's a good idea or not? Other people, how do I'm you not feel following about you? You're saying he wants to add conditions to one and two. What are the conditions? Um, as, written out of the memo. as outlined on page two of the memo. My only view on that, Peter, is that I think that we've already, to me, we've already determined that from the materials we've looked at, the discussions we've had, the site walk visit that um, we partook in um, with regards to making that finding that that was not going to happen. So to make a condition on something that we already believe isn't going to happen, I don't think is necessary, but that's just my it, It's belt and suspenders, I agree. But it, it seems to me that those points didn't register in the course of the litigation. So to me, it just makes the point a second time in a different way and doesn't, and doesn't hurt us. Other people's feeling? Yeah, I would agree with Peter that uh, the, regarding no use by anyone in the parking area, that should be a condition. Anyone else have a feeling one way or the other? So, just to, so Peter, your friendly amendment is for number one to insert that there be a condition approval that there be no use by anyone of the parking area behind building number three in nighttime hours, which shall be defined as dust to dawn. And then with regards to number two, you're asking that that the condition of approval be added. It says that all of the existing lighting as shown on the site plan and shown on a picture of the east side of the building number four included in the application continue to be angled downward to eliminate any unnecessary illumination of the night sky. Yes. Okay. I have no problem with that. Okay. I agree. All right. You got all that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I do. All right. All right we, we have a motion. Do we have any further discussion? All right, all those in favor? It's unanimous. All right, we're good. Thank you. And thank you, John, and thank you, Maurice, for all your hard work. All right, next item on the agenda, Hidden Court Subdivision Amendment. Margaret Angel and Nathan Nathaniel Thick are requesting amendment to the Hidden Court subdivision located in the area of Ocean House Road to adjust the common lot line of lots one and three. Section 16-2-5, amendment to previously approved subdivision. Public hearing. I will have a short uh, presentation by the applicant or the applicant's res representative and then I'll open for public comment. Okay, to start, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, if you want to come to the microphone. Sure. My name's Nate Fick. This is my wife, Margaret Angel. Uh, Margaret was here at the workshop in July. We're the applicants, and uh, we're thrilled to join the community. Uh, thanks for your consideration of the change, and we just wanted to be here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. So, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> good, good evening, um, Madam Chair and uh, members of the Planning Board. Uh, my name is Spencer Thibodeau. Uh, I represent uh, Margaret Angel and uh, Nathaniel Fick. Um, I, as we did, um, was that last 
uh, at the end of uh, July um, came before you um, for uh, two reasons. Um, the first, um, many of you have had the t opportunity to review the larger plan that we that we provided, um, um, and uh, the two changes are as follows. Um, the first change, um, as you can see, um, is the conveyance of a 241 square foot. Um, parcel to uh, the Stonehouse lot. Um, and just to give you some orientation here on the diagram behind me, uh, the Stonehouse lot is to the north. Um, and um, as you can see, the gate actually traverses over the property line onto what's called the Garden House lot, which is lot three of the subdivision plan that you're looking at. Um, and essentially what we're proposing is to convey that portion uh, to the Stonehouse lot. Uh, the second change um, that we're requesting is a little larger parcel at, <laughs> at, uh, it's okay. at uh, 9,700 square feet, um, which is uh, acting as a buffer. Um, as, as this board uh, may know, um, currently there is no structure um, situated on the Garden House lot. Uh, which is located here. Um, and uh, the hope here is to provide a little more control um, uh, as to the buffer between the two parcels to make this parcel actually work with, uh, with an additional structure on the garden house lot. Um, to the, the question that was raised um, by uh, a member of this, of this board um, at our last session, um, the, uh, there's also a, um, currently a, a view easement, um, which is uh, uh, recorded in gray on the plan that you have, that essentially extends from the base of the pool area towards um, the water. And um, that remains in effect as an encumbrance on title um, and uh, is not changed. Um, again, these, the, the conveyance is, the, is really the only change here um, that's before um, this board. Um, we too were um, pleased by um, uh, the, uh, uh, the town engineer uh, conclusion that, there were, that, that the changes were appropriately done, um, that there's um, no subdivision or engineering related comments. Um, and as we said at the last uh, meeting, um, it's, a, it's a pretty simple conveyance. Um, we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, and uh, again, are so thankful for the opportunity and very thankful for um, the work of staff and Planner Omera um, uh, for their work on, on this as well. Thank you. All right, I'm going to now open this for public comment. Is there anyone who would like to speak on this matter? Seeing no one, I'm closing the public comment or the public hearing. All right, uh, the board. Comments, questions? Pretty straightforward item. Very, especially once you get a bigger plan. <laughs> so, anything? A motion? All right. <laughs> And just, uh, I think we got a lot of, like you said, it was straightforward. We got a lot of an the questions uh, answered at the workshop last month. So I have a motion for the board. All right. Okay. Findings of fact, uh, Margaret Angel and Nathaniel Fick are requesting an amendment to the previously approved hidden court subdivision located off Ocean House Road to revise a common lot line between lot three, the garden house lot, and lot one, the stone house lot, which requires Review under section 16-2-5 amendments to previously approved subdivision findings for standards of review that apply to the proposed amendment follow. The subdivision uh, will not cause subdivision erosion uh, based on the erosion control plan provided. Uh, the subdivision is compatible with the zoning ordinance. The subdivision uh, does provide the act to, for access to direct sunlight. The subdivision does provide a vegetative buffer and screening as needed with the proposed lot line changes. The subdivision plan include, uh, does not include a phasing plan. The applicant has substantially addressed the standards of the subdivision ordinance at section 16-3-1. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Margaret Angel and uh, Nathaniel Fick for an amendment to the previously approved hidden court subdivision located off Ocean House Road to revise a common lot line between lot three of the garden house lot and lot one, the stone house lot be approved. Do I have a second? Second. I've got 
two hands over here. Who was first? You got we'll, it. we'll give it to Jim. <laughs> All right. Any, any further discussion? <laughs> it was a tie. <laughs> any further discussion? All right. All those in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. What's next? Next time I'm on the agenda belongs to my my esteemed colleague Joe. Can I leave my stuff here? All right, the next item, Tower Specialists, Inc. are requesting site plan review of the construction of a new 180-foot tall telecommunications tower to be located at 14 Strout Road. The applicant proposes to remove five existing towers on the site as part of the new construction. The application will be reviewed for compliance with Section 19-9 uh, site plan regulations. Um, so we will begin with a presentation by the applicant. You can go ahead and introduce yourself. Good evening. I'm Justin Stroh, representing Tower Specialist for this project. Uh, we're proposing to put in, uh, we're proposing to put in one new 180-foot tower um, while replacing the existing towers that are there uh, because they're structurally overloaded. And we want to have uh, the latest, greatest structural tower we can have. So we've applied for that. Um, I wanted to show you guys where the site is. It's located at 14 Strout Road. Sorry, I have some more close-ups, but you can see the aerial view taken from Google Earth. Uh, it's off Spurwink Ave. And then this shows the overall site on the left. And on the right, it's a little bit closer view from Google Earth. Then I've taken pictures from uh, the corner of Wells Road and Sperling Cab. And this is the existing site. It's taken with a 50 millimeter lens, which is about the equivalent of the human eye. So it's like what you'd see if you were standing there walking on the side of the road. <coughs> zoomed in so you could see the other, you can see two of the other towers. The remaining two towers are a little shorter, so they, they don't show up in this image. And this is what we proposed for the transition period. There would actually be three towers there for a while. Um, it's kind of hard because this isn't a zoomed in view, but that's what you get from walking around or if you're driving by in a car. And then this is what it would look like in the final phase. You just see these two towers. Now, most of the time, if you're looking at the right angles, you'll, you'll see it, you'll think there's only one tower because one obscures the view of the other because they're so close together. This is our existing conditions. It's the enlargement of the first page. It takes away some of the uh, extraneous material. And it's showing that we're trying to consolidate um, an existing support equipment area, which holds uh, generator, outdoor cabinets in the building for existing customers on the tower that's there. This is what you're seeing currently. The tower that's right in the forefront there is the one that will be staying and that's the existing support equipment area. There's a building for US Cellular and there's a canopy that's covering uh, Sprint and then there's another canopy that covers Excellus. I can show you this right here is, is Excellus, it's the FAA, and this right here is US Cellular, this is Sprint, and then this is uh, Red Zone Wireless. They're a newer, uh, they're a small time wireless company. They offer wireless internet to home subscribers like Time Warner would. This is just Justin, a different. Can you go back one second? Yep. Can you just point to the tower, that, that tower in the back is the one going? That's one of the ones going, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I can. What was your question? Oh, I just want to make sure he points out the tower that's going away. The one in the background? Yes. yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. You see, you see it all right? I have, I have other pictures I think that might show it better, too. 
like I said, this is more of a overall shot of everything in the site compound. Um, what I'm trying to show is what we've proposed is, uh, as Maureen and I discussed it, it's a little different than what you're used to. You're used to having me lay out like all the buildings, where the slabs go, where this goes, where that, that goes. And we're trying to propose this so that as the customers come, as the technology changes, we have an area that we can place these things within and just get a building permit rather than bugging you guys to put in a concrete slab that really is just more of a pain for everybody to, to deal with. This is our actual site plan and it shows the phases. I'm going to skip over and go to the next one because it's an enlargement so we can see it better. Uh, we're proposing two phases and I do have one thing that I, I caught afterwards that we didn't specifically mention. I didn't realize it wasn't as clear until after I looked at it. But in phase one, we would also be proposing to build the propane tank area, which is right there. So we would be building this area here, which it goes into the existing structure that I just showed you. And then the tower would be there, and then the fence line would go along here. And most likely we would be grading for everything in advance because it just seems like it would be too much of a hassle to try to grade only a certain point when the drainage depends on the grade that we're creating. But inside these areas, we would have, uh, like I said, there's a propane tank area that's designated specifically so that we won't have issues with uh, this closeness to the generator or any structure. So you don't want to have, at this point, we picked 25 feet to keep away from ignition sources so we can match what the requirements are in the NFPA 58, I believe it is, which is what main fuel board goes by. It's essentially like, like I guess like the fire marshal, but for fuel tanks and propane and oil and stuff like that. So in the support equipment areas would be where we would basically, I don't want to say go willy-nilly because we still have to get a building permit, but we would go to the code enforcement officer with the plans and he would look at it and say, okay, good to go, rather than coming back to you every time we want to add a 10 by 10 slab. Um, so my goal is to meet um, basically all your requirements and have it spelled out so that anybody in the future knows exactly what's expected of them and we don't have to, to worry about it, you know, and do the three month process every time somebody wants to add an antenna to the tower. So you're proposing basically a building envelope. Correct. Yes, we, I designated the support equipment area because it kind of made the most sense because that's what it is housing. Um, it's ancillary equipment for the tower and for mostly for the antennas that get mounted on the tower. And currently, if I wanted to mount an antenna and it didn't need a slab or a building, it would just be a code enforcement officer thing anyways. So we're trying to, to make it so you don't have the burden of trying to figure out how a 10 by 10 slab and, and everything goes into it you know, for the three month process. Because it's something ultimately the code enforcement officers can handle you know, without any problem. Now this is looking up, this is, you can kind of see the existing, uh, the corners of the existing fence for the existing support equipment area. This is where the tower base would be. So it's, it's right on the other side of the, the existing access drive. kind of hard because it's dim in here, but this is the other side. You can see the corner here. It basically comes out this way a little bit and then comes over here and then it all connects back in. Um, I don't know exactly where it is. I don't have it laid out on the, the picture, but it's somewhere around this area that it's um, phase one and then phase two would come over here a little bit further and connect in. This right here is showing uh, it's not directly from the base of the tower, but you're getting an idea of where we're proposing to put the east anchor, which is actually down over the embankment a little bit further. It's not really right on the edge of the road. I just couldn't show it any other way than that because the tree covers there. Um, so we would be removing trees to about this point here. This, there's a big like four trunk oak and that would stay. And then it's basically smaller trees and I think there's three or four big ones in there. They're noted on, on the plans as to be removed. And then there's smaller trees that we didn't map out because they were all under the, you know, what the standard was. And this right here is the west anchor area. 
same thing. This tree and the other big ones behind it would be stained. There's a few birch trees that look like they're good sized trees, but we would take them out because they're a risk to fall on the guy wires. And as everybody knows, birch trees are pretty weak. And I don't want a chance having a tree fall on a wire in the middle of the winter time. So this, this area here would be cleared out for the anchor path. And you can see the existing guy wire is right over in this area. So it's, it's kind of an expansion, like they'd be one anchor path and we'd keep that area clear and uh, basically planted. It probably will revegetate itself just like the other one because I haven't planted anything. You can see it's got quite a bit of um, bushes and growth and everything there to help with erosion. And this right here is looking towards the north anchor, which is actually up, it's up on the, it's in between the road, I don't know, it's not really the end of Strout Road, it's, it's where the access road begins up there. It's, it's across from where we've proposed the gate, and this barn would be staying, this pine tree would have to go because it's in, in by the, where the tower is, and there's a couple other, there's a birch tree and there's another tree that would have to go, but the majority of the trees around there would be staying. Uh, the ones that are behind that area would all be staying. We would be removing, because this is actually a trailer that's being used for storage, it would be removed, and there's a couple of trees that would need to be removed over here just so we can get our um, grading elevations so that we can keep the flow of the water in the right directions. This is standing where we proposed the gate. It's essentially looking south. Uh, you can see this is the existing tower with the support equipment area here. The base of the tower is actually, you can see it, but there's like a little tree here. The base of the tower that we're proposing would be right there. So it's, we've kept it compact and tried to minimize what we do for, for damage on the uh, <laughs> trees and erosion control. So, do you have any questions on this stuff? I'm sure you do. <laughs> so. Okay, um, before I open it to the public, keeping in mind that this is for determination of completeness, do any members of the board have any questions, clarifications? No, nope. <coughs> Joe, just one. Oh, Pete. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, as I saw the plans, the you have the fence around the proposed new area. The propane tank area is not enclosed within the fence line. Is this typical? Yes. It's uh, when when I called the fuel board and talked to them, um, they referenced the NFPA 58, and I ordered the manual for it. So I have like the, the actual standards. But basically, what it is is it's a bulk a bulk standard. Um, the site can have up to 4,000 gallons of propane on site, and they can't be larger than, I believe it's a 1,000 gallon tank. We have one customer that has a 1,000 gallon tank, the rest of them are 500. Anybody that comes in for the future, it will be 500 gallon tanks, period. So we figure there's gonna be maybe five tanks total, and that's 2,500 gallons total. So it doesn't need to be fenced. If it's over 4,000 gallons, it needs to be fenced, but it also needs to be um, approved by the fuel board and it needs to be permitted and basically like if if we let's say because I know what you guys are thinking <laughs> if we were to put in 5,000 gallons worth of propane tanks if a propane company comes to fill it they would report us and not fill it at all because they know the rules and if they fill it they get in trouble if it's not like if it's not on their license um, we went through this with oil tanks on another property at one point so Basically, we follow the rules of NFPA uh, 58 and keep it under the, the 4,000 gallons, which I think is very reasonable. I think when I was at the workshop with you guys, I know Henry brought up about the fencing, and I had thought that the, the tanks were 1,000 gallon tanks and they were actually 500 gallon. Uh, I wouldn't confirm that. Like I said, there's one 1,000 gallon tank. Uh, I believe there's two 500 gallon tanks on site, and then there's a 120 gallon tank. I think that's it. I don't have the actually drawing right from me, but there's nowhere near the 4,000 gallons now. And if we expand, it's not really an expansion, it's more of a move. So the tanks that are on site, I'm actually going to move them to that propane area. So we have them all in one area rather than having like a mishmash of tanks in different areas. Do, 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 do. <laughs> I know I'm getting old, but not that old. <laughs> um, do you have to clear 
vegetation around a tank to keep in case it catches fire and starts a. It's actually in between the two guy paths. Uh, let me see if I can show you. All right, uh, the propane area is in this corner here, and the one guy wire is coming down. All right, hold on. Sorry, I'm on the wrong picture. It looks better in my office because it's a little darker. <laughs> now I guess that was it. Sorry, I'm using new technology. It's not helping. Me. There we go. Well, I guess the answer would be yes or no. So. Uh, no, I found the picture that was before. The propane tank area is in between the two guy wires, so it will be in an area that will constantly be cleared because we don't want trees and vegetation growing up into the guy wires. I have to have access, so if I need to do any maintenance to the tower, you know, the anchor points, I can do that. So, <clears throat> sorry, just one other question. God forbid something should happen, and you get a fire, does it affect the guide wire? It could, but at that point, it'll be probably 70 feet above the tank. You know the tank area because the guy wires are coming from the tower. Um, on one tower, they're at 80 feet, and the other one, I think they're at 75 feet. So it, it'll be quite high above it. So I don't anticipate that being an issue. Um, of course, we, you know, if you have a disaster, you have a disaster. But it's not something that I think you could you could probably say that anything could happen. If we had a big earthquake, we could have an issue too. Yeah, I, I guess. It depends on the length of time that they would be eaten, and I guess it would go up pretty quickly, so it would dissipate yeah. <laughs> pretty quickly. Yeah, but it is, it is not directly underneath the guy wire. It's, it's uh, I don't have the exact measurement in between, but I'd say it's probably 25 feet off center of each guy wire because we didn't want ice from the guy wires to fall onto the tanks. So we've kind of we've tried to lay it out so that it made the most sense and gives protection to the tanks. If, if the tank were underneath the guy wire, we would actually put a canopy over it so ice couldn't fall and like break a valve or something like that. So, yep. Okay, anything else? All right, um, I'm opening the meeting to public comment. Is there anyone in the chamber who wishes to speak? No? Nope? Okay, seeing none, the public session is closed. Um, does anybody have uh, any more questions? Jeff. Oh, sorry, Victoria. Um, I know we're about to close this on completeness, so um, did you have any comments on any of the comments by the town engineer? Yep, um, I actually have Bob Metcalf with me to comment on the erosion control and drainage and grading and things like that. Would you like to hear from him first, or would you? It's okay. I was just wondering if um, there was anything here that you did not want to comply with the questions. I want to comply with everything you want me to comply with. <laughs> um, no, we've got, um, I know one of the things that, that was in there was the uh, financial letter. Maureen, did you get that? Because I have a copy of it, if not. The, the financial capability letter was provided to me and forwarded to the whole planning board. Okay. I just want to make sure. So, as far as what, what Steve Harding said, um, you know, they support us on a few of the waivers and they were leaving it up to you guys on the others. Um, I think the only things that I'm not going to comment on, because I could answer most of the questions, but I'm not as good as Bob as the stuff on the grading. So I might let Bob talk to you guys about that. Sure. I think, you, Victoria, do you think it goes to the issue of completeness or be better served in the... Next yeah, I mean, yeah, I know that's why I was kind of hesitant, and didn't, but um, if you had any comments to the negative that you wanted to discuss. Why, why don't I let Bob talk to you, because I don't feel there's I, anything. I'm, on, I, I'm hearing that. I'm all set on this, so I don't probably need a lengthy discussion on this, but. I won't make it lengthy. Bob Metcalf, <laughs> Metro Associates, we take no issues with any of Steve's comments. So pretty straightforward housekeeping type of items. Thank you okay, very thank much. Thank you. All right. Would anybody, do you have anything else? No, I just didn't okay. want to speak for Bob because he's the one that's done the bulk of that planning. So. All right. 
Uh, would anyone like to make a motion? I'll make a motion for completeness. Theodore, based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Tower Specialists Incorporated for site plan review of the construction of a new 180 foot tower, tall telecommunication tower located at 14 Strait Road be deemed complete. The following submission information waivers are granted. One, survey information for the north and south property boundaries. Two, soils information for the entire 25 plus acre site. Three, traffic study for photometric study. Five, a demonstration of financial capability, which is which has been sorry. I was just suggesting that they don't they no longer need a waiver. Yes, that because it's already been yes. yes. I agree. <coughs> B motion to table. Nope. Okay. That's it. Second. Jonathan second. Any further discussion? I Jim. just have a question. Did you do you need number five? Yes. Okay. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor? All opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Yeah, motion to table. Don't you the motion to table? We're not First sidewalk. Okay. So we need a sidewalk? Yes. I'd like a sidewalk. Okay. I would strongly recommend the planning board do a sidewalk. It's a fascinating site. I even wanted to before I knew it was a fascinating site. Did you screw it in there? Did you guys have a thing in mind? Direct the lead on this one? Yes. Can I be recognized? Yes. If, More I, I just need to, in full disclosure, if you expect me to be at the sidewalk, I'll be on vacation from the 17th until the 30th. You certainly can do the sidewalk without me. When do we have to do it by? Typically, you try to do it before the submission deadline, which doesn't give you a lot of time, since the submission deadline is September 1st. So to do it before the 17th, we have to do it tomorrow. <laughs> we have to do it on the 30th or the 31st. Yeah, we can't do it tomorrow. 30th? How's the Wednesday? The 30th. Good. Well, do you have any more No. Early or late? Late. Late. 5.30? Is that... Yeah. Five thirty Thursday, yeah. uh, Wednesday the thirtieth. Bring bug spray. <laughs> <laughs> Wednesday, Wednesday the thirtieth. August thirtieth. Yeah, five thirty. Can I ask just two questions? Or? Yes, I have a question as well. Go ahead. Okay. Um, in regards to noise, I think you were saying you may install a sound blocking fence. What are your thoughts on that at this point? I think what, what I would prefer to do is to do this as a condition and have it be the burden of the cell carrier, but have a specific condition. So what we would do is for the first generator that we have there, if we end up doing one of our own, it meets the sound, the sound standard because of the distances and the setbacks. The second one, because you know, as I know you guys deal with this all the time, so the second one won't like double it. I think it, it's like next DBA to, to the sound level of the first generator. So at that point, what we would do is we would either enclose the generator itself or we would put up a barrier along the chain link fence on the exterior. I have not, I wanted to wait until you guys had specific questions before I really discussed it with the manufacturer of the sound deadening panels. Uh, can I ask you a question? Because I was thinking about that. So the sound, the, these units are tested once a week. And there's no reason they all have to be tested all at the same time. They right? usually aren't. So the only time they would all come on is in a power failure. Correct. And 
I know we've discussed this before, but does does the ordinance really apply in the event of a power failure? I mean, is anybody even worried about the sound at that I point? did try to offer that to you when you were reviewing the tower in Shore Acres that um, you could make a finding that in an emergency, you know, this would be a temporary situation, and you rejected that. So Me personally? The planning board as an entity um, made clear that they felt that the site uh, in Shore Acres should meet the sound maximums all the time. But, but that was a little but bit different because one, that was one carrier. I'm just saying what your past practice has been. But that was for one generator. Right. But we were pretty strict on them putting in sound barriers and and yes. we brought up to them that if there became a, tie, a time where a co-location happened and more generators were brought into the property, that they were going to have to address that issue. And that's why I wanted to have it so we have it, we have it spelled right out as a condition. So if, if somebody complains that there's a noise issue, the code enforcement officer can clearly look at it and say, hey, you guys didn't put in the sound deadening panels and that's why this is an issue. Not, you know, I don't, I don't want to have this be a game that I can't, you know, in five years I can't put in a generator because I didn't do something, you know, now. It's not a big deal, though, to put in the sound panel. No, it doesn't it doesn't appear to be. I just, at this point, to, to have it be a condition like that I have to do it right from the get-go, we don't have any proposed generator at this point at all. So I'd prefer to have it be contingent on the generator, and I feel that that isn't an undue burden to the code enforcement officer to have it be a requirement that he says, you know, you got to put in you gotta put in this sound deadening if it's if it's a U shape around it or if it ends up being a box around it. The other thing that we could entertain is like I did with the propane tank area, I could actually designate more of like a generator area. Um, I just have to keep twenty five feet away from the propane tanks. So I could look that over and do like an envelope in there. I, I just want to caution the board that uh, usually the owner of the site is the one that's responsible for making meeting the conditions of approval. And to delegate it to the code officer and whoever is installing the antenna, uh, that's really deviating from what you typically do. I think that whoever is the owner of the site, mm -hmm. you, would be the one obligated to meet whatever standard the board is going to hold them to. Right. Okay. Good question. How, how close are your nearest? The nearest property line, I think, is 274 feet. Well, actually, it was not, not so much the property line, but so much the uh, housing or uh, well, the nearest residence. Is, um, 350 feet, maybe, and it's over. It's the, the site is in one location. There's a hill that's all buffered, and then they're down the hill right next to Spurwink Ave. So they'll probably hear the traffic to Spurwink Ave more than they'll hear a generator. You know, so, can, so, so what I was just going to comment is, is on an evolving site like that where it's not fixed at any given time, I and mean, it could increase or decrease. I think that the, one of the terms and conditions would be that the sound didn't exceed a particular level at any given time, and then that would, I believe, would cover it, would it not? Well, that's the way the ordinance is written. It says that during the day in that area, because it's residence A, it says that it's 55 dBA, and then at night it drops down to 45 dBA. And the question that, that I think Joseph was talking about is one that I would kind of pose is this is an emergency thing. It's not a regular basis thing. The, the exercise, which is when the, the generator runs for 20 minutes or a half an hour once a week, or sometimes once every two weeks, is always done during the day. That would not be something. It would be something at like 11 a.m. It would run for 20 minutes or 30 minutes. And that's something I can absolutely control and mandate with the, the customers that come there, you know. But... Um, the only thing that I could see in the ordinance that spelled that there's anything near it is actually after the tower section, there's uh, the wind generation section. And it specifically requires 55 dBA 24 hours a day that it has to meet at the property lines. And that's, I mean, it's a generator, so it's kind of along those lines. I just, the 45 dBA at night is what kills us, you know, for more generators. The 55, we could probably have three generators, maybe even four, depending on, once I do an actual look, look over it, it may be four generators we could have um, 
And that's assuming I use big generators. A lot of people are using the smaller, like the 10 kW generators. These were spec'd out for like a 40 kW generator, which is enough to run the older cell sites. Everybody's switching to the outdoor cabinets where they just have a little box and a little fan in there, so it's not this huge you know, HVAC unit on a wall and all the lighting and heating and everything. I make a suggestion that um, it's, it won't be decided tonight. No, I understand that. Meeting. Could you possibly bring in information as to um, the proposal? I heard you say right now there's no generators, but there could potentially be. If you could tell us how the potential and some of the other information. Yeah. I don't know if this board is going to say, well, it's an emergency, so no, we're not going to put any conditions. Mm -hmm. Or this board would say, with four or five generators going on for hours might be a little too much, right. even in an emergency situation. Yep, no, I, I don't know where we're going to go, but if you could bring in the information. There, there is some information in the packet on the sound deadening for the fencing. So that's, that's where I was running to, was the, to either put up, they have a material that goes along the chain link fence itself. Yes, and um, the, it looks pretty good. I mean, it's like the equivalent of like, if you put up one piece, it's like the equivalent of like nine inches of concrete. So it's, it's a really like, it's really looks like it would be good. And the lay of the land actually um, helps as well because where the houses are, it goes up a hill and then back down. So the sound, any sound for the property lines would literally go up to that hill, bounce off and go up. So I think we could probably, if we, we did some sound testing, we could probably meet the sound without any problem on that side. It's the other side, which is the newly appointed Tower Overlay District, that we would have the, the issue. But then they're going to have the same issue if they come and apply for a tower too. So it might be that we build one in the middle and everybody's happy. Well, you can bring in whatever your proposal may be, the okay. fencing, the cover. I heard a couple of things, but whatever you're proposing, that okay. would be helpful. Does anybody else have anything? Joe? Yeah, Exhibit 7. Mm -hmm. Hold on one second. <coughs> yep. I've never designed a tower, but at first glance, your, your cross bracing, uh, your so first glance, not doing any calculations, you've got uh, diagonals, uh, two inch angles, just seems small. And uh, you've done more towers than I'll ever do in my life. I didn't design this though. The, the structural engineer designed this. So okay. And he's got, <laughs> and on a typical section, he's got half inch bolts. Again, it just seems small. And at the base, I've never used anything less than a one inch A325 bolt. So that's me. The numbers may work out, but that's, you know, I don't know if you have, you know, he's got his stamp on there, so I assume he did his calculations. Um, and you've got a table under design the pertinence loading, but I don't see any loads. If I'm reading it wrong. Yeah, you must be reading it. The, uh, the loads are all listed there with numbers next to them. And then the elevation. That so the, like the top one for that 4800, the, the, so the load would be 10738, is that the load? Is no, that's nine. the type of antenna. What's that? That's the type of antenna. Okay, so. so what, we did, what we did, Jim, is, is we took what a standard cell site is nowadays, which is some pretty big antennas and some pretty big equipment. Yeah. They have eight foot tall antennas. Um, and they mount them across on what they call a, like it's like a side arm or a boom mount. You know, they, they mount those, and then they have all the radio equipment is mounted up there. It's it's quite an endeavor. So we've gone worst case scenario with this design. So there's actually 12 of those antennas, four on each of the three sectors, and then all the lines going to it, all the extra equipment that we could put on there. Everything's on there for for five cell carriers plus the existing um, equipment. So there's, there's a substantial load on this. But you gotta keep in mind, this tower is also a solid lake tower, so it's a big, heavy tower. So it's designed to be a lot taller and a lot heavier for structure wise. But this, the guy that designed this has been doing this as long as I can remember, and I've been doing towers since I was this tall. So, in the, so everything you see here, this is what something you'd normally do? Absolutely. Okay. Like I said, I've never designed a tower like this, and that's why I was asking the question. Well, and, and we designed this tower specifically this way, but it's actually capable of holding much more if we increase the guy wire size. But 
because we don't know what we're going to put on it at first, we decided to go with a smaller size guy wire to save some money until we have to, uh, until we actually have the need for it. Okay. All right, Jonathan. Just to echo what Victoria said about the sound, um, I don't mind holding the feet to the fire to these cell phone companies to make it so, because we're going to have to see them, but we'd ra I'd rather have them not be heard. So yeah. I think well, that should be helpful. I understand exactly what Maureen's saying, so that's why I'm thinking if we can if we can figure out if we can figure something out, it'd be nice because I, you know, if I have to build a sound deadening thing to hold six generators and I never have any generators, that's kind of that's a pretty big burden on our end. Um, you know, we're not a big we're not a big company, and this is already <laughs> a really expensive endeavor as it is. So I'm trying to. Well, I'm not trying to cut costs, but I'm trying to not have to spend money that I don't have to spend. I'm not, yeah, I'm not saying or suggesting the, the point that you have to build something for equipment that's not there yet. Mm -hmm. um, but if you get into agreements with these cell phone companies, then that might be something you have to put on your side of it that they're going to have to fit the bill. For yep. Being built, so. so maybe, maybe what I'm understanding from you is maybe we have um, like a like I did with the um, phase one and phase two. We put in like a step for generator one, generator two, generator three, like something like that? Or how would you? Well, I don't know, I can we talk more to the board about this, but I think it's something that if it's not done, if it's gonna come down on somebody, it's gonna come down on, on yes. you, not that it's uh, gonna come down for the cell phone company. So you right. can say, hey. No, I'm the landlord, it comes down on me and then I hammer down on the tenant. Right. So, but yeah, I think um, what Victoria suggested earlier that you come to us with a specific proposal about how you're going to control the sound okay. and leave it at that for now. Okay. I did have a question um, in regards to the engineer's letter on item number five. And item number five, it said um, we, town engineer are also unclear as to whether the road section would be considered a private road, private access way, or a driveway. Where are you reading this, Victoria? I'm sorry. This is the town engineer's letter. Okay. This would be page two, item number five. And they were just asking, and if you could please clarify, is this considered a private road, private access way, or a driveway? The way we contend it is that Strout Road comes up and ends at the residence that's currently there. And this is an access, like a gravel access drive to the tower site. So it's not, it's not part of the private way. It's not a road. Um, it's just a gravel access path. Or I don't know how you put it, but it's. It's a private access way. It's not a private road, though. No, I don't way. think it's private access way as defined under the ordinance. It's a service drive, I'm told. <laughs> it is a drive. Well, this was something that came up and something I think the board may want to think about. And you may want to think about it after you've seen the site. So I believe under the ordinance, it doesn't have to qualify as a road. It doesn't have to qualify as private access ways. It is just an access drive. But it's an access drive to some pretty significant infrastructure. So the question to the board is, do you want to look at the road a little bit? Maybe do you want to consider asking the applicant for some kind of road maintenance agreement so that we know that it stays open all the time? So this is more of a asking the planning board to think about the significance of the site and what, if anything, do you want to ask the applicant about in terms of the quality of the road? Because it, it isn't triggering any of our usual standards. Um, if, if I may, the, the road is probably maintained better than most roads anywhere because there's thousands and thousands of dollars of loss if somebody can't, couldn't get into the site and there was a problem. So nobody wants to not have access. So it's maintained, it's plowed on a regular basis. Um, it's always been it's always been maintained. Um, when we do the site walk, it'll be it'll be good because you guys will see it, and it supports. Uh, It'll support any any equipment we want to bring in there: crane, uh, tractor trailer trucks. I mean, it's it's a very well built road. It's not your standard, like I just built a road in the woods road. It's it's probably par to a city street if you would. You know, it's just gravel. So you know, it says the width varies. Would you just uh, rebuild the road to the width that it's at now? Is that your? Well, we're actually not proposing to rebuild it. 
you have a little section in there where you're raising it. Yeah, what it does is it's, it comes down a hill now, and in order to, for us to meet all the drainage, you want to hold the box up. Okay. You want to keep going or you just... <laughs> well, back down. We put that cross section in because when we're coming in from a high point, coming back down towards where the new tower is going to be located, we've got to bring the grade up around the tower. And what happens is that road section drops down so much that getting the transition grade back up to the service, the gate that goes to the existing tower complex and the proposed becomes too steep. So we put the cross section in just to show the town engineer how that particular section will be filled and constructed. Basically using the town standard, if you will, in terms of construction and depth. So that, as Justin said, that this requires equipment going in and out. They don't want to be pulling something out of the, out of the mud. So it's a case where that detail was only more just to show how that short fill section, and it's only probably 100 feet total length, where we're bringing the road up anywhere from a foot to almost two feet in some section in terms of the fill. And so you could get a fire truck in there, oh, yes. and the fire truck could easily yeah. get out. Yeah, we did it right now the way it is with the existing tower is it's coming down at mm -hmm. the bottom. You can come down and it's like a cul-de-sac, if you will, so you can now get all the way around in the back. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Do I have a motion to table? Motion to the table. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Tower Specialist Inc. Uh, for site plan review of the construction of a new 180 foot tall telecommunications tower located at 14 Strout Road be tabled to the regular September 19, 2017 meeting of the planning board, at which time a public hearing will be held. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. By the way, great job of the Latin pronunciation. I was my soul time. All right. Next item on the agenda, 27 Fowler Road, BB District Zoning Amendments. The Cape Elizabeth Town Council has referred to the Planning Board a request by Brad Pearson to change the zoning for 27 Fowler Road from Residence A to Business B and to make text changes to the Business B Zoning District to permit a landscape landscaping contractor. Section 19-10-3 amendments to zoning ordinance and zoning map. All right. I'll let you kick off, Maureen, if sure. you please. Sure, I would be happy to. So where you are on this is the board had a site walk at 5.30 tonight. Um, you have been, um, you've looked at this through workshops, you had an informational public hearing, and now you've moved it back to the formal planning board meetings to start the formal process. So the hope is tonight that you will um, look at the current draft in front of you, will identify any potential changes you would like to see, and then to table this to next month's meeting when a public hearing will be held. You are required to hold a public hearing before you can make a recommendation to the council. So uh, on page two of the memo, um, I have identified potentially a few things you may want to talk about, and you don't have to talk about any of them, but um, one of them is the, the limitation on the size of vehicles that a landscape contractor could have. 
and this was an effort to um, distinguish a landscape contractor from an earthworks contractor where the earthworks contractor has a much larger minimum lot size. Um, right now, um, the last draft had the maximum size as a class six. Um, the board had asked for, to bring that down to a class three. The applicant had asked for class five. The current draft is class four. Um, my understanding is that you would like staff to work on this a little bit more and bring you back a proposal next month. Yes. Uh, yes. For, for the two members of the board who were not at the site walk, uh, we had quite a bit of discussion regarding gross vehicle weight and size of vehicles and it became very apparent that a little bit more research needs to be done in order to, to do that appropriately. It's very confusing. <laughs> Who's going to do the research? Okay. Um, welding uh, at the last workshop, the board had decided to limit welding to only that it would be that would be needed by the landscape contractor for the landscape contracting business, so there wouldn't be any um, contracting out of welding. So that's the current draft limits it just to the landscape contractor. Uh, the next item is you had asked. <coughs> excuse me. The outdoor storage area is limited to 50%, no larger than 50% of the lot area, and there was a suggestion made that that be contiguous, and the, the draft has been changed to add that. And then um, the setbacks are proposed to be 40 feet from the road and 20 feet from all other property lines. 20 or 25? 25. Did I say 20? You did. I'm sorry. 25. That's okay. It's late. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any comments from the board? Any questions? Oh, Go ahead. Carolina, I, I raised this before and I'm not trying to be a dead horse. We, this language, like the earthwork contractor language, has two categories. In this case, landscape contractor and landscape contractor's yard, and I understand it's, it's following the other model. The one thing, I guess I would ask Maureen, or can we have something official, eventually officially on the record, is to, is there any significance to the two terms as they're used in the following sections of, of the ordinance? Because, for example, minimum lot area speaks of landscape contractor, 40,000 feet, um, when you get into the um, setbacks, they go to the contractor yard. And is one or both a use? And is there some, you know, is, is there anything we have to think about in, in using the two terms? Do they mean anything different? I, I can take another look at those. Like, again, as you said, this was a structure that was created and it's been mirrored. Um, I share your concern with Well, and if the, we're going to make a recommendation, we, back and forth. we could rationalize the both of them. We could take the earth work contractor thing and, and make it read, make them read the same, but reconcile this use of two different phrases. So what you just suggested, Peter, let me make sure I understand that is, to figure out which which way is clearer and say that uh, you wanted to have just one term, either landscape contractor or landscape contractor yard, whatever we choose, then take this opportunity also to change the earthwork contractor, earthwork yard. Yeah, I mean, if we can discern a reason for having the two terms and, and understand how we apply them differently within the ordinance, fine. But if we can't find any reason to have the two, I just think for the for trust for posterity, it'd be nice to have a more understandable single term, and we could fix them both. Yeah. Um, I mean, the only time I flip them back. Jimmy, you want to put down your microphone? Um, well, I guess you got the two terms because you've got the one that describes a business and the yard is the 
physical location and and I can understand why you have two terms. Um, I don't know. Uh, well, I guess the question is, are they different? Are they different businesses? Are oh, I see. Like, same? like you got the minimum. Why you don't say landscape contractor's yard where it says forty thousand square feet? Is that what you're saying? Well, they they talk about the yard as being a use. And if, if that's the well, use and the landscape contractor is not a use, what is it? I, I think, I don't know if I agree with that totally. The yard is the actual space. So, yep. it, like under minimum lot area, it doesn't make sense for the landscape contractor to have to be 40. It's, it's the yard that has the minimum. It's the year. But, it, I mean, I, I think that should be landscape contractor's yard, 40,000 square feet, and also above it, earthwork contractor's yard. I mean, elder care facility, the elder, the elder people aren't five acres, it's the elder care facility, right? It's the, it's the I guess my comment is this, that if we're going to totally revamp this, <laughs> <laughs> I think you need to send it back to a workshop <laughs> so you can look at the totally revamped text and before you, I mean, otherwise I'm going to be take, making all these changes unilaterally by myself and then you're going to hold a public hearing on it without even being able to look at it yourself. I guess my first reaction is that's an unnecessary delay. Yeah. You know, to go back and do that again. I don't have a problem with how it's written. I I'm, think it's clear. I agree with I agree with Jim. So, I guess we'll let that one go. I think that was like all right. Anything else? One issue. Um, I see that there's a motion in our packet to table this for public hearing, which I have no problem um, doing, and we discussed this a lot during. Um, the workshop and uh, the numerous times that we've addressed this about how this is kind of a unique piece of property that the applicant is asking to be rezoned since it's basically um, it's so the, the abutter is already zoned as a business B um, but is this going to be two different things that we're going to look at whether or not to um, a, to grant the applicants request for a rezoning and then do the text, the text amendment separate? In the past, I've usually made, written it as one motion that has two different things in it. Okay. Um, when we did the special event facility, we had both text amendments and a map change, and the motion was written to acknowledge both of those. All right. Okay. You're right. If you did just one and not the other, you could end up not getting what you thought you were going to get. All right. Anything else? Anyone like to make a motion? Go right ahead, sir. Motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that based on the map and proposed text amendments and the facts presented, the request of Brad Pearson to change the zoning for 27 Fowler Road from residence A to business B and to make text changes to the BB district regulations to permit a landscaping contractor be tabled to the regular September 19, 2017 meeting of the planning board, at which time a public hearing will be held. Second. All right, second. I just have one question. Go ahead. Would this be the second time that we're having a public hearing yes, it is. on this? Yep. All right, that's my only question. We, we specially requested a public hearing because as we were going through the workshops because we wanted to get a feel for public comment. So here's their second opportunity to speak. Thank you. Anything else? All those in favor? It's unanimous. All right. Thank you. My compliments to whoever scheduled the... Uh, meeting tonight for their accuracy. <laughs> uh, well, I have 
And now it's uh, opening it up for comment on items that are not on the agenda. Does anyone wish to speak on comments that are not on the agenda? Seeing none, <laughs> we'll close that particular Move, we one. adjourn. And we have a motion to adjourn. I have a second. Any discussion? All right, all those in favor? And it is unanimous. Thank you.